Hello and welcome to Intro to Computer Games and Simulations here at Lorain County Community College. I am Mike Substelna, your instructor this term, and this week we are going to be talking about functionality, completeness, and balance in game design. Previously, we said that playtesting was our best way of determining what is fun and what is not fun about a game. That's very important that we playtest our games. Today we're going to deal with how to get feedback from your playtesters. This chapter is pretty abstract and I will do my best to make it as concrete as possible. Um, Fullerton suggests you break down your playtesting into discrete phases. And her reasons for this are um, because a game is a complex system and you cannot fix everything all at once. By the way, Fullerton is the, uh, Tracy Fullerton is the author of our textbook game design workshop and we're in chapter 10 if you're in the third edition right now. Um, so let's talk about what we test for. Here are the phases that Fullerton suggests in your textbook. The first phase we call functionality. The second phase we call completeness, and as you might guess, the third phase we call balance. And we're about to dive into the details of what those three mean. First, let's look at the question of, is your game functional? So you recruit playtesters that have never seen your game before, and you watch them play the game from start to the very finish of the game when they have, for example, rescued all the koalas. If the players can complete that game without any input from you, then congratulations, your game is functional. Now, if the playtesters get stuck, if they are unable to complete your game, then your game is not functional. And that happens. Let me tell you from my own personal experience, Last Halloween, writing for Artemis, Tom Robertson asked me to code a spooky Artemis mission. Doesn't that sound like a great idea for Halloween? And I spent a month designing and coding this mission that uh, teams of uh, Starship crews would play. And I wrote in some interesting challenges that I thought no player had ever seen before and uh, information to help them overcome those challenges. And I got some local actors to recruit spooky voices and sound effects to go along with my mission script. And then I took my finished spooky mission script that was so awesome to a convention in Tucson to be playtested by a crew who had never seen it before but knew how to play the game. Well, they didn't do what I expected them to do. They drove their starship in the wrong direction to start off. Um, because that's what the clues seem to tell them they should do. Even worse than that, they destroyed a friendly spaceship that was supposed to help them later. That left them in a pretty bad situation. But the information as they interpreted said that was the right thing to do. So, my players, my playtesters, got completely stuck in the game five times. This is important. It's my fault that they got stuck. I needed to give them better information. They needed to better understand what was happening. This wasn't incompetence. It was not being able to interpret the information I presented them. Clearly, my mission was not functional. And last Halloween, crews around the world did not get to enjoy my spooky mission script. Hopefully next Halloween, they're going to get the chance to do that. So in the question, is the game functional? A game is not functional until players can complete it. I hope that's clear. But there's more to playtesting. We have to look at, is the game complete? Is there a case that is not covered by the rules of the game? Uh, you may think of this as more having to do with board games and tabletop games and card games than computer games, but it is possible for the rules of the game to not cover a case, like in Evil Clutches, your player flies off the map forever. What does that mean for the game? 
Um, do the players argue about the rules because there's a conflict built into the rules? Can the players reach an impasse where it is impossible to solve the conflict that exists in your rules? Do the players discover a way to win the game every time? For example, in Evil Clutches, if there are no babies and you allow rapid-fire fireballs, just hold down that fire button and keep going up and down. They will score infinite points and never be in any danger at all. There's another example, spawn camping. This is something you may be familiar with. In a multiplayer game, characters must enter the field of play somewhere. So what's wrong with killing them just as they appear? Is a game that allows that. That's called spawn camping, standing there where they're going to appear. Is that game complete? It's possible to win every time that way. Well, let's look at other completeness problems. How about loopholes? Oh, here's a classic loophole. The light attack, lightweight attack munition, the lamb in the game Deus Ex. All right, that's supposed to be something you can stick on the wall. But it was not intended as a climbing tool. Yes, it can stick on the wall. Yes, you can exert force on it. And it turns out if you put them on a wall and you climb before they explode, you can go over a wall in that game. And that allowed players to go places they were never intended to be able to go. That was a completeness problem. More completeness problems, how about dead ends in games you might have made, where players do get stuck and there is no way out. And it's not because of bad information. It's because you built into it no way out of the situation. Well, completeness is a judgment call. It is much like fun in a game. You can call the game complete at any point. For example, if you made Deus Ex, you could say, well, a uh, lamb climbing isn't a bug. It's what I meant them to do. And boom, that makes it complete. Now, many games are truly never complete. Online games, for example, constantly are adding content and often have the word beta, like you see Farmville screen there, has beta on it. It's always considered beta. Now, let's look at the final thing to test for. Is your game balanced? This can be difficult. Does the player's experience meet the goals you set when you started to work on the game? You can balance for player skill. For example, golf handicaps are a way of balancing for player skill. Uh, that way, players of different skill levels can enjoy competing in the same game against each other. Um, you can have difficulty settings in multiplayer games where high skill players must help the low skill players. And a medium difficulty should be available for uh, players that have the same skill level. Now, do the starting positions of your game give one player an unfair advantage over the others? Um, identical starting positions, that indicates something we call a symmetrical game, like backgammon, or basketball, where you both tip off. Asymmetrical games give one side an advantage, yeah, sort of like a typical zombie apocalypse scenario where the hordes of zombies outnumber the human players considerably. Many tactical simulations do this intentionally because they are simulating some battle or that happened in real life. And in real life, usually, wars are not balanced. Most historical conflicts were, in fact, asymmetrical, as uh, battleships fighting each other, etc., where we might find tables of even ships that look similar to each other. Um, here we've got the Bismarck and the Hood showing uh, that the Bismarck's guns, even though they were both carrying about the same size 15-inch guns, the Bismarck's guns were much better than the Hood's guns. Is that game balanced? Well, what variables can you change to affect game balance? 
In Popsicle Rescue, that I think you all played, the player can only fire two diamonds at a time. Well, you didn't all have to play it. That's just one of the playtesting games available to you. You can balance with game dynamics. Um, if you had a catch in uh, Super Rainbow Reef that filled half the screen, well, that would make the game so much easier to play. That would change the balance. So much easier than the default with the normal size catch. And you can use the game dynamics, which we talked about uh, a couple weeks ago. Dynamic problems can come from those super objects or combinations of objects that allow superpowers to be developed. Relationships of objects. Imagine this version of chess. Suppose a player takes an opponent's piece then he or she gets to move again. That's kind of like when you're shooting in billiards. If you sink a ball, you get to shoot again. What if chess were like that? Well, we can think about the first player to take a piece would probably then take another piece, and then another piece, and then another piece, and the game would end very quickly. And, this is important, a game that ends that quickly would probably be a lot less fun for both the winner and the loser of the game. Now let's talk about power-ups and dominant objects. You have to balance strength with vulnerability and scarcity. Perfect example is the One Ring in the Lord of the Rings games. The One Ring is a very powerful object, but when you use it, there are terrible vulnerabilities that can end the game quickly and it's scarce. It is the one ring. There's only one in the entire world of the game. Or in uh, Artemis Spaceship Bridge Simulator, you have nuclear weapons. They are very, very powerful, have a huge area of effect, can take out lots and lots of enemies, but they are scarce. They are hard to come by, and it takes a long time to acquire new ones. Now, Balance can reinforce character, as we saw in uh, the, this example here, where we have the different characters that have different powers and different vulnerabilities. Those powers and vulnerabilities help to make the characters more exciting, more dynamic, more engrossing for the players. And I strongly urge you to use this and have the choices of balance, uh, choices of strengths and weaknesses affect the characters that you have in your games. All right, you can also balance a game by assigning asymmetrical objectives. What does that mean? It means one player can win by doing something different from what another player has to do. For example, can two Colonial Vipers in this Battlestar Galactica game. Fighting six Cylon Raiders, can that be fun? Well, it certainly seems asymmetrical there. Well, if the objectives aren't the same, suppose the humans win, all they have to do is have one Viper escape from the map. Well, that doesn't sound all that hard. The Raiders can only win if they destroy both Vipers. Set that victory condition, and suddenly you've got something that might be possible. One Viper can cause a distraction, sacrifice itself. There may be other options. Um, that would balance the game considerably, and the Raiders don't get to win by escaping the map. Um, what happens in this mission I wrote for Artemis Spaceship Bridge Simulator when you are outnumbered by hordes of AI enemies. Well, you make the player ship faster than the AI enemies. That helps balance it. The weapons also hit harder than the AI enemy weapons hit. Um, and let's talk about another asymmetrical objective, the ticking clock. Here we have the example of plants versus zombies where the player wins by just surviving for a certain time period. The zombies don't win by surviving for a certain time period. It is the player that is trying to make it through wave after wave of zombies. An asymmetrical objective balances the game. 
Okay, that's it for this week. Next week, lucky, lucky, lucky you, you're going to get to meet Tom Robertson to talk about his life in the computer games industry. I'm sure you're going to find that very interesting. He's worked for major game companies and uh, been quite successful both working for the man and working for himself as an indie game developer. I know you're going to love it next time. So we'll see you then in Intro to Computer Games and Simulations here at Lorain County Community College.